Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our final summer lecture of CRM Talks. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my great privilege this evening to welcome Melissa Josephiak, the director of the Essex Historical Society and a longtime friend of the museums. Uh, Melissa has served as the director of Essex Historical Society since 2014. Prior to that, she served as a curriculum mentor to 11 historic sites as part of the STEPS Connecticut Professional Development Program, as well as assistant director at the Weathersfield Historical Society. She holds history degrees from Washington College and Central Connecticut State University, and she currently serves on the board of the Connecticut League of History Organizations. Please join me in welcoming Melissa, who this evening will be uh, her topic is following the Falls River, connecting Essex's three villages. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you all um, for participating in this evening's uh, lecture. We really appreciate it. Of course, I was just saying that we've had several days of rain and a potential uh, tropical storm, and now we've got beautiful weather. So I really appreciate you coming out on a, on a lovely evening like today for a, a Zoom lecture. Um, so our talk tonight is following the falls, connecting Essex's three villages. Um, this, is, this could go on as a series. So it's a challenge to talk just about the Falls River in a 40 to 45 minute uh, time frame. But I'm going to go through a talk and keep it as focused on the Falls River as I possibly can. Um, this will not be a talk about the history of all three villages. There's just too much information. Um, but I'm happy to answer your questions at the, uh, the very end, and we'll do our very best uh, to field those questions and then relate it back to the Falls River uh, in some way. So just to start off with a little bit about Essex's, Essex Historical Society. Our mission is engaging and inspiring the community in Essex, Centerbrook, and Ivoryton, um, and bringing history outside of our, our two historic structures, which you may be familiar with. On the left of your screen is Hills Academy at 22 Prospect Street. That is our archives and library and offices open year round Tuesday and Thursday mornings. We are staffed by almost 10 volunteers who answer hundreds of research requests um, every year, either in person or through email. And on the right is our Pratt House, which was built in 1701 and then extended all the way through 1832. It is the town's only historic house museum. We've had it since, 18, uh, since 1985. And we give public tours um, by appointment, regular hours in the summer. Here of COVID-19, uh, we're open on Sunday afternoons and that is staffed by more than two dozen volunteers. Uh, we are largely a volunteer organization with one paid time, oh, excuse me, paid part-time uh, professional, but we offer year round programming. Uh, in a traditional world, we are in all of the villages doing many, many uh, projects uh, and working with the public as public historians. You may have seen us in the upper left-hand corner there at our popular lecture series, Standing Room Only at Essex Meadows in January. We offer a variety of walking tours, such as Essex Village, which is coming up on uh, September 19th, Centerbrook, which is coming up on September 3rd, and our Riverview Cemetery tours uh, the first two Fridays in October. We do a number of parades. You can see trees in the rigging at the bottom left. And just recently, um, the Iverton Independence Day Parade on July 4th. So it's more than just our historic structures. We're always trying to get into the community to partner um, with as many collaborators as possible. In any given year, we uh, have 30 collaborators, either virtually or in person. And we're so pleased to work with the Connecticut River Museum tonight and also on September 25th, and we'll be bringing you the Nolan Beaker Project, talking about um, the area's river Native Americans. So it'll be really interesting. Please mark your calendars for that. So this is on this slide, a traditional world. And then of course, when COVID-19 hit last year, we had to completely rethink how we engage with the public. So we had a few um, projects that were, as we like to say, COVID proof. At the bottom right hand corner there, you can see our pollinator garden right behind Pratt House. So it is a garden specifically designed to attract pollinator insects and birds. Um, and then that helps us, that helps the plants grow. And so we're so pleased to have something on Pratt House which says that this 
historic property of two acres has been growing items or farming for more than 300 years. We quickly pivoted to our Zoom lecture series. You can see the actress uh, Tammy Denise in the upper right hand corner. We concentrated on African American history in the lower Middlesex County area, which is very, very well attended. We are pleased by that. We always collaborate with our neighbors in Chester and Deep River. Uh, vintage baseball was always very popular, could, couldn't run that uh, last year, but we um, came together on a virtual series talking about the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. So we celebrated the last 100 years of women's achievements in, um, in the three towns, and so we put together two of three um, online slideshows. We up, also opened up a, a YouTube channel. You go right through our website at essexhistory.org. You can see those two slideshows and hopefully this fall, we'll be doing the third one, which will bring everything right up to the present to 2020, 2021. Um, but probably our signature program during COVID-19 was working with the school systems. We had been in the classrooms um, in previous years. They had come to Hills and to Pratt House, um, but of course they couldn't take buses, they couldn't do field trips. Um, all of that stopped through COVID-19, but they are among our top collaborators. So some very hurried calls to uh, the school system said, how can we help you? And they said, come into our classroom virtually. So you can see at the bottom there, I've got an object um, showing the class, giving them online lessons, complementing their curriculum. And then through another grant at the Community Foundation of Middlesex County um, and through the Essex Elementary School Foundation, we were able to fundraise for individual audio devices so that when COVID restrictions were slightly loosened, we were able to get the students out of the classroom into the outdoors and give them uh, walking tours. It was the only field trip they had the entire year. So 150 students in fourth, fifth and sixth grade EHS was able to give them history content. So there are ways that we can be responsive to, to the community's needs. And above all, our multi-year um, program, Follow the Falls, which is what I'll be talking about tonight, is a program that we have been working on with Essex Land Trust um, since 2017, and it will be most likely going through to 2023. It is a celebration of the Falls River, taking a look at its uh, natural beauty, its historic significance, and how it affected uh, the people and the environment in our immediate area. So we do that in some non-traditional ways. Um, our standard publication, if you'd like, is a book, and we're going to focus this every other year on a different village. So we started on Falls River Cove uh, at the top of the screen there, and that will be the focus of uh, a portion of today's talk as well. And we took that um, online, created an e-magazine with video, how to learn more. That's on our website, on our Follow the Falls uh, tab. Then um, we installed signs at Falls River Cove. You can see that right in the center, interpretive sign that teach you about what was here before. We had a fantastic lobster bake uh, in June of 2018, and we will be celebrating Centerbrook now um, this, this summer and having a lobster bake on September 12th. So we talked about Falls River Cove for about a year and a half and offered a number of tours. You can see at the bottom right there, Live, uh, leading a tour at Osage Trails Preserve. And then we were also on the radio, ICRV in Ivoryton. And then we pivoted to Centerbrook, which would have been the unveiling in 2020 had it not been for the pandemic. But never daunted, we looked in a, in a different way. So we did a traditional publication, you can see on the right there, our Follow the Falls publication on Centerbrook, Crossword Community Change. We also put that online so you can read it at any time. And then we worked with Centerbrook Architects in addition to our um, presenting sponsor over above. And they produced for us a three minute virtual slideshow of what the town would have looked like more than 100 years ago in 1910. So with vintage images, with some creative magic, um, you can take a virtual tour of Centerbrook. It's as if you just can walk down the street and see what this ever-changing village looked like. Um, so those are some of the programming ways that we get out and, and use Follow the Falls, but our natural inclination to work with um, Essex Land Trust is uh, we both have a sense of place and that can be the natural world and it can be the built environment, um, but we come together to celebrate how the Falls River connects all of three villages. 
which is the focus of our talk tonight. So to get the lay of the land, to understand where we are with the town of Essex, this is a simplified map of the town itself. And we talk about Essex's history as three villages, two rivers, and one shared history. We know that the three villages are Centerbrook, Essex, and Iverton. And we recognize the Connecticut River as that first river, the long blue stretch you see on the, the right. Just to the left of that in purple would be Essex Village. In the center in a lighter green is Centerbrook. And to the left in kind of a beigey brown is Ivoryton. And what ties them all together is that Falls River. So if you could see just at the very end on the left there, um, where Wright's Pond is, this mostly Essex and also um, Westbrook. And that is one part of the feeder stream that connects the Falls River flowing west to east all the way through Essex, coming through Ivoryton, Centerbrook, Essex, and emptying out on the top right hand portion of that map into Falls River Cove, truly tying all three of those villages together. You're going to see a lot of maps in this evening's talk. Um, so this is a wonderful map from Essex Land Trust. And they um, highlighted all of the different um, open space areas, 325 acres in the town of Essex alone. Um, and the orange lines signify the general watershed of the, of the Falls River itself. And then they highlighted the, the three um, fish ladders that are overcoming some of the dams that are in the way. We're talk, going to talk about the dams um, an awful lot this evening. Um, so the, the geography of the Falls River um, needs to be looked at in some detail too. So um, on the southeast section of Killingworth, um, there's a geologic structure called the Killingworth Dome, which most likely was caused by a meteor millions of years ago that formed a high section of geography there. And from that Killingworth Dome sloping down through a ridges for about 300 feet is, excuse me, three, uh, three, uh, 300 feet, let's say, um, is, the, um, is the Falls River. And as it goes down, um, you'll see that Falls River watershed gathering where you would have the feeder streams starting in Ivoryton and Westbrook and Deep River and going all the way through um, to Falls River Cove. Um, we'll be looking at those uh, maps as we go through. So that sets the scene. Um, we've got glacial till that has carved the land and then we'll be talking about a number of geological uh, features as well. When we think about human habitation of this area, we must start with Native Americans. We have objects in our collections that go back more than 9,000 years, but there was most likely habitation here in, uh, in the Essex area going back 10,000 years. And we're learning more about Native American inhabitants all of the time. Um, at least 3,000 of the most recent years, um, we believe that there were the um, Nahantuck tribe that was here, um, part of the Algon Algonquian um, culture coming down from the Great Lakes. And through that period, the Nahantics are part of the Western Nahantics from the Connecticut River all the way to the Thames River today. Um, and they were very tied in with the Falls River. So we have three repositories that we know of that objects have been taken out of in Essex Village and then also in Ivoryton. And that's the image that we're showing you on the right. Uh, there was a rock shelter, well, there still is a rock shelter in the Bushy Hill Preserve in Ivoryton off of Bushy Hill Road. And uh, we believe that that was a, um, a hunting camp right there on the uh, side of the falls. And an archaeological dig in the 1960s brought out a number of objects of project projectile points um, that, that this was a hunting camp used for hundreds of years most likely by the Nahantics. So as we think about the Falls River impacting um, not just the, the settlements, the Native American settlements in this area, but it was very specific that they're gathering uh, fishing and hunting right on the Falls River. And we have the, the objects, the artifacts to support that. Uh, we do have a sample of an artifact here um, on the screen, and that is an ax head, a basalt ax head. You can um, imagine where the wooden handle would have been attached in the groove with sinnoh with sinew um, animal uh, gut, so to speak, um, and would for, to provide a very sturdy, sturdy handle. Um, and many of these objects we're learning more about all of the time. 
on the left hand side, the former archaeologist, the late archaeologist, unfortunately, of of the state of Connecticut, Dr. Brian Jones, gave us an entire day a few years ago and went object by object and dated them and, and really taught us more about what we had in our collections. Um, many of these pieces were just dropped off at the Historical Society and now we can put them in, in full context. And that's how I'm able to give you the years. He was able to date so many of them. And then of course, when um, the contact period with Europeans occurred in the 16 teens, 20s and 30s, of course, the disease, European diseases, really took a toll on the native inhabitants there. And um, subsequent um, conflicts with the European settlers as well, so that the Nahantics were either absorbed um, and or they passed uh, away in large numbers. There are Nahantics still left. I am so pleased to tell you that just this summer, they, re uh, they elected a new chief, and that is Chief Ray Tatton in the center of the screen here. And so the Nahantics are coming together as a tribe, and we will be hearing from Chief Tatton on September 25th at the Connecticut River Museum. So this is very much a part of a continual history that we're learning more about the Native Americans and how they are still here. They're just not part of the past pre-contact period. They are a living, breathing part of the history of this area. So let's talk about the contact period. I want to put things in some perspective for you. When we think about Adrian Block exploring the river in 1614, and then subsequent waves of English migration up the Connecticut River, um, by the 1630s, you're getting settlements in uh, Wethersfield and Hartford and in Windsor. And then 1635, there's a separate colony, the Sabre Colony, which is formed in Old Saybrook. And that Sabre Colony encom encompassed nine towns today, all the way from Lyme, Old Lyme, to Westbrook, all the way up to Chester. Um, and that wide colony continued for uh, a few years. And then by the 1640s, it was absorbed into the Connecticut colony. Um, but the settlement right down at the, uh, at the mouth of the river was Saybrook. And there's always an interest in more land. Saybrook spread out, settlers from Saybrook are spreading out. And by the 1640s, they are surveying what we call the town of Essex today. Um, their Clark and Lay and Hyde and Pratt are coming into um, the Essex village area and they are surveying the space and they're saying there is good land up here so that you get settlers by the 1660s headed into our area. And, and the large geographic area that is Saybrook was broken up into four quarters or manageable parts and we are known as Potapog Quarter. That's Chester, Deep River and Essex today. And it gets its name um, Petapog or Potapog from the jutting of the land or the peninsula that is um, Essex downtown, Essex village today. So as we look at this map from 1811, um, why are they coming up to this area? And you can see above the word Saybrook where it says Petapog, um, granted it's an 1811 map, but you can see the Falls River again is going from west to east with its tributary streams, its feeder streams going from west to east and emptying into the Falls River. And there are two churches already designated that the Congregational Church in Centerbrook and then what would become the Episcopal Church in Essex and then a few squares. Those squares are mills and they're all located on the Falls River and they're in these early uh, time periods around the year 1700. They're harnessing the water power in the Falls River to move the settlement along. And they're, the first of the villages to be settled in earnest is Centerbrook. And Centerbrook is selected because it's so flat. Now, this is a, a photograph from about 1900. And it's down Westbrook Road. And to get your bearings, if you look at the right-hand side of the photograph, you can see Centerbrook Meeting House. And then if you look just down the left from that, you'll see the cemetery. So we're on Westbrook Road as if we're coming down to um, Plains Road. And you can see how flat the land is, fairly easy to clear, not difficult to farm, and very well irrigated. With the water power that is on the Falls River, those first farmers are subsistence farmers. It's hand to mouth, it's feeding my family, for this first couple of generations from the 1660s, 1680s, 90s, pretty much up to 1700. Then they're able to get enough um, crops so that they can possibly take them to market. 
And as they turn toward the river, the Falls River, they can see the potential in harnessing the water power to create small mills to ease um, their burden labor-saving devices. So as we look at this general map of the Falls River and the seven dams, actually eight dams, that were located on there, I'm going to be referring to this map throughout the evening and referencing which dam we are at. We're going to work largely chronologically, and then we're going to start from the right and go to the left. Um, but it's very important to keep um, geography in mind as well. So as they're forming two dams. We're going to start at the dam that was labeled number four, right in the center. And that is um, what we know today as Centerbrook Architects. This is a topographical recreated map that we did for our Follow the Falls project with Essex Land Trust. And, and um, uh, many acknowledgments to Essex Land Trust for laying out this map. So you can see how flat Centerbrook is. Um, this is the Falls River at the very top, the line in blue with the mill ponds and then the Mud River, which runs along Scotch Plains today. Um, that is largely kind of a marshland, you can see in some in, um, certain areas, um, but all of the land in between is completely flat. There's about a mile, a square mile of arable land, and that was exactly what those early settlers needed. So they're farming the land in between these two rivers, and they're starting to dam the river. Up there at the top, um, you'll see 1703, the Ironworks Dam. Um, the proprietors or the decision-making landholders of the 17th century were trying to recruit specialists from other more populated areas to help them set up these mills, to have the knowledge base to create them. And so they are looking at um, a bloomer, a Mr. Wright, who chooses not to take the bait, so to speak, and create a dam. And they eventually um, contract with a Charles Williams of Rhode Island, an established bloomer, a man that's skilled in working with iron to create uh, a dam in 1703. And that Williams family, you'll be hearing that a lot this evening, um, develops a, a small enterprise on this dam. Shortly afterwards, in 721, the Williamses also develop another dam, and that's right at Centerbrook Architects today. We call this the Williams Clark Dam, but a dam, but in common parlance, you would think of it as Centerbrook Architects. And that takes advantage of the natural drop in the Falls River, about 18 feet goes down. And um, from that, they can dam up the river and now um, consolidate the pressure, run the water through a sluice or a race, control that pressure to turn a water wheel that will turn machinery. So they're creating a grist mill to grind their corn and their grain, and then a sawmill um, as they're clearing their land and they're creating um, lumber. This is for their own use and also for market. And that would be to the area villages and also then trucked out to the Connecticut River and exchange for the seaports there. All of this is located now in the flat areas of Centerbrook. So there are Native American paths that had come through this area. You can see that in Westbrook Road, um, through the center of the screen, and then up to the Deep River Road, connecting other parts of Potapog, Chester, what we know today as Chester and Deep River, to Westbrook Road, then to Bochum Road, which was the main road into Saybrook. And they're always connected to Saybrook because that's where the large settlement is at that time. Now the road right in the, in the center there that would go to the left or to Main, that says Main Street today that would connect to West Centerbrook or today's Westbrook where there are, um, there's pits of bog iron. And for ironworks uh, to develop, you need the bog iron, the raw materials to be refined into so many different iron implements necessary, not just for ships, but also for farming, for tools, and also for export. Export, And then the road to the right, Denison Road, would take you to Falls River Cove and eventually connect to Essex Village itself, where the seaport was. And all of these roads come together in Centerbrook, where the good land is, the dams are, and this is where the first villages starts in, in, S in um, the town of Essex. And so by 1722, they're developing their congregational church. It's seven miles to walk, or if you're lucky to have a cart to go to Saybrook, mandatory services every Sunday. So they petitioned these, these people in uh, Potapog, petitioned the General Assembly to create their own parish 
and by 1722 they're developing the first of the congregational churches here um, in Centerbrook. So I want you to keep that in mind. This is the early development of uh, Centerbrook and those two dams on the Falls River. And that's why, because of the Falls River is why we're getting that early settlement. So um, as we look at what is left today from that development, you can see um, the Falls, it's about a 1900 photograph. Um, it's a little different from the dam that we have today. And you can see the two gentlemen down there at the bottom part of our Follow the Falls team. They actually were able to find the original 1703 dam. We had heard rumors about it. It's not really on our main map, um, but I think it was a couple of Veterans Days ago, they were out there with a yardstick and, and they could find the remnants of that first 1703 dam that was um, destroyed and kept underneath when the higher dam at Centerbrook Architects was built. And then on the grounds of Centerbrook Architects itself is the original um, millstone from, uh, from the grist mill made of French burr stone. And those two um, stones would grind together, uh, powered by the water wheel that would um, support the grinding of the grain and the corn so that they can save the, the labor of the farmers and be able to ship it out. So we're gonna move ahead. We're gonna move down the river. I wanted to talk about that first one, um, that early one, which is number four. And now I want you to go to the right, the upper right, and that's the, um, the, no, the dam that's labeled number one. That is today Osage Trails. Um, the preserve of Essex Land Trust. And um, the modern photo is up there at the right. If you were to visit Osage Trails today, you would see this beautiful part of Falls River Cove, except for the trails, it's all private property. Um, but when you look at that, it's hard to imagine that this was once a pre-industrial site, that it was that there were more than 50 men working at a shipyard and an industri pre-industrial complex in this location all based on the Falls River. And that first development, again, starts very early in the 1690s when we have the proprietors are asking, um, again, skilled millwrights to come to this area and build a dam. They do, and it's, and it's quite small, um, but by 1733, um, the Andrews family that had developed that, they're working on a grist mill on the south side of the dam, they had uh, moved on and who steps in? the Williams family again. And they're developing a grist mill on one side and a sawmill on the other side. And from these images, you can tell the extent of the development. So the grist mill is at the bottom right hand uh, side of your, of your screen. And the grist mill itself is the building in the center and then the miller's house to the right. To the left would be uh, the dam. And if you go across the dam, you would see um, the sawmill by the middle of the, the 18th century. Um, they raised, the Williams family raised the height of the dam, rebuilt it after what we believe was a um, kind of a catastrophic uh, flood around the 1730s or so. And then they're also building a bridge so that, um, that the carts could get over, the um, lumber could go back and forth. This was a regular road. Um, in Essex up until the 20th century. Um, and here we see kind of at a, at a high water mark where the spillways are um, full, maybe after a storm uh, itself. So the Williams family then are operating a grist mill, a sawmill here at this location, as well as the one in Centerbrook. So they've kind of cornered the various markets of uh, milling in this area. Now, they're a very enterprising family and see the potential what's going on in the larger part of Essex. And as you, as you think about the development, general history of this area in the, seven, in the 18th century, we're a seaport, we're always trading. Um, from, the 17, from the 1650s, Connecticut, the colony of Connecticut is trading with the West Indies. The West Indies themselves are producing sugar. That is their cash crop. Uh, it's probably the most valuable crop in the world at this time. All of those West Indian islands are devoted to um, are devoted to producing sugar based on a slave plantation economy. And then, so they need to import anything else from um, to sustain that economy on all levels. So 
in the triangle trade or the triangle web, if you if, if you want to look at it that way, the trading web, um, you'll see that there are sugar there are sugars and enslaved people being shipped out of the Caribbean. Those are also brought from Africa in exchange from uh, for the the produce, the um, cattle. Um, any kind of manufactured item, the lumber, the desperately needed lumber that was coming from New England, and then from Western Europe, um, anything that is uh, manufactured with a high degree of skill. And so this, um, this exchange trade web goes back and forth. This was the number one way um, to make money in Connecticut, in New England at that time. And the Williamses see the potential of what's going on and they want a piece of, of the action. So as you look at that trading web and an image of the, um, the West Indies as they're, they're shipping out uh, their sugar and their, um, their rum, and um, here is the George Hurlbut uh, Williams made ship, they are going to get into the, um, the shipbuilding market. Within a few years, by 1796, the Williams family has expanded their role at Falls River Cove. So this is a great map that we produced for our first Follow the Falls project in 2017. And there's a color code at the right, and I'll walk you through the development of the site and what it means to, for the development of the, of the Williams shipyard. So it starts with the dam, the dam in the 1680s, um, and that's the red line at the left. That has the sluice way running through it to power the water wheel. The grist mill and the miller's house down at the right, so they can observe uh, the work and that's going on at the dam. The dam is eventually extended and the sawmill built in the beginning of the 18th century. That also has a dedicated sluice way to it. Now remember, the Williamses are also producing ironwork. They're doing that in, um, in Centerbrook. They move that ironwork production to uh, Falls River Cove. There might be some still going on at Centerbrook, but they know that there's a major enterprise going on here at Falls uh, River Cove. So they have a third sluice way and they create an ironworks and what they call the island uh, right in the center. So they are now expanding their empire. And if you look to the, the top of the Northern section of the cove itself, they've got a bulkhead for tying up ships. There's a ship's house where there was the planning that was taking place. They're producing their own lumber to create a, uh, the, the ships themselves. And it's a whole new skill set that they're developing and they're employing at least 50 skilled men on, at this one location. We also find that, um, that they are making packages. We have um, records at the River Museum and also at Mystic Seaport that itemize how many feet of board um, required for decking and how much for um, other aspects of the, of the ship itself. And they're making house packages and ship packages just in the sawmill to get shipped out of Falls River Cove so that it can be assembled elsewhere, whether it's the West Indies or other ports. So this is what we call the vertically integrated enterprise, where they're consolidating as many operations as possible into one family and their workers all in this location. So it's very much a pre-industrial complex located on Falls River Cove at Osage Trails. And the ends at the very bottom there, by 1800, there's very little lumber left in all of Connecticut. So they are floating the lumber down from Northern New England um, colonies and then seizing it, um, seasoning it behind what they call the water fence or the, or the stone fence itself so that it can be cured and weighted um, for the next, so it can be used in the production. So they're also supplying their own material. Now, by the 1840s, though, we see a change in um, shipbuilding here in, uh, in Essex. And that's a story that many of you are familiar with. It's hard to compete with um, deep water ports. Ships are getting larger all of the time. The, um, uh, the sandbar at the mouth of the Connecticut River is always going to be a challenge. By the 1830s, the British have liberated um, their enslaved people so that there's not the plantation economy, which is the targeted um, market for these particular um, ships, so that when you lose your market, you're going to, to reduce production. So by, the, by 1845, the, um, this particular shipyard has gone bankrupt, and then they actually, the Williamses um, shift 
to the end of um, New City Street, and they have a shipyard down there that continues um, throughout for a couple more decades. Um, now, there are other shipyards that can consider um, that continue later, but this is we're just going to focus on the Falls River Cove one. Now, I showed you Osage Trails before in an earlier photo. So this is based on archaeology and research, and there is a wonderful archaeological team headed by Dr. John Pfeiffer, who um, led a team here in around 1889. Uh, 1889-1990, excuse me, 1989-1990, and um, based on their archaeology and um, the research, we were able to reconstruct. So what is left today? Thanks to some drone technology, we can get an aerial view of what Falls River Cove looks like today. And once you look at the map first, and I was rearranging my slides, I had this image first and then I swapped it. I wanted you to look at the map first, and then you could pick out some of those pieces and we can toggle back and forth. So the white building right in the center, which is in private hands, that's the old sawmill. The sawmill is still there. If you look to the left of the sawmill, you can see how the dam would go across. You can see the island, just it's kind of a brownish scraggly section with the white um, tree skeletons there, but the dam would have gone all the way across. The bridge came down in the 1920s. Below the sawmill house, you can see the sluiceway. The tail of the sluiceway still comes out. And you can see on the other side, there's also the, um, the head race where it's coming in, um, still continues under the, under the building. So on that island would have been the iron forge. They did find the floor of the iron forge during the, um, uh, during the dig. And to the left of that, the next waterway to the left, to the left of the island, um, was the uh, sluiceway for the grist mill and the, um, the forge itself. And then the foundation, at least two of the foundation walls are still there from the grist mill. Um, but there's more underneath. On the right hand side, the, um, the basis of the, um, the bulkhead is still there too. We took another walk in 2018 and we were able, 30 years after the archeological dig, that material is still underwater. Um, as part of the bulkhead. So when you look at this space and you think, oh, it's so idyllic, it's so romantic, it's so lovely here, the material for the pre-industrial complex is still located on Falls River Cove. So it gives you a clue at, as to how, um, how Essex is using the Falls River as we go along. Now I do, um, as a historian, I like to bring things up to speed. So, you know, time is always uh, is a continuum. So um, the Williams's largest ship in, in 1814 would have been the Osage. And on uh, April 8th, um, 1814, the British in the, the War of 1812 the 12, sail up the Connecticut River um, to destroy the American shipping that is at Essex. And they burn 25 ships, they take two with them. And the largest one they burn to the waterline is the Osage that is located in Falls River Cove. Despite some efforts from, from very valiant men and boys, it burns to the waterline. Um, the Williamses do con continue to make ships after that, but the Osage as the largest ship built up until that time becomes kind of the rallying cry. It's almost our remember the Alamo, remember um, the Osage. And at low tide, you could still see, I understand the ribs of the boat still sticking up through the water. It was never removed. Um, by the 1930s though, they did remove um, what was left of the Osage and there on the upper right hand corner is a gentleman sitting on the keel. Um, and there are a number of objects in our holdings and also river museums and maybe in personal collections as well of objects made from the Osage. Um, even the, the high school yearbook was named Osage and there are a number of places in town and that became, it was the hallmark, um, the glory days of Essex's shipping is all encompassed in that one word the Osage. Um, so the production continued at the building. After the Williamses went bankrupt, there were a number of investors that were at the site. And at the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the old grist mill, and it was used for making buttons, for hardware, um, for coffin trimmings. Um, they had a special uh, room that, they, that would um, treat the wood, the steam house. And um, then my personal favorite was the Indestructible Paint Company was housed there. You can just imagine what Falls River Cove, Cove looked like. Um, but by the 20th century, it had become um, a beautiful ruin. 
And the stories of the Williams Complex and the Osage were basically stories that looked more uh, romantic, as you see in the colorized photo, um, postcard in the upper left. Um, but a woman here in town with a long memory, her name was Elizabeth Diz Callender, and she grew up in Essex, and she and her husband uh, wanted to live on the shores of Falls River Cove, and so they had a beautiful eight-acre property, and she kept those stories alive so that in 1999, she willed those acres um, to the Essex Land Trust to create the Osage Trails Preserve with that caveat, so that you would always remember Osage and you would always remember the shipbuilding that was going on in that cove. Even as we like to say at EHS and Essex Land Trust, there's no there there, um, but with some careful research, we can pull it back to um, what it was before. So we're gonna move west, to, we're gonna move east to west now. We're gonna concentrate on dam number two. Um, which is on, um, you think of it as the Pratt Tiley Dam. We know it as the Mason Post. It's the one just off of Denison Road. So, this is the original Pratt Tiley or Mason Post cons um, construct. It was built in um, 1802, and then Mason Post and William Strickland take it over in 1840. Um, they are doing, there's a lot of ivory work that's going on in town, very small scale. Um, they're producing ivory buttons. They're working with um, hardware at some point. And then they're also making um, augers and drill bits. By the 1870s, there's a group called the Centerbrook Manufacturing Company. They're into making hardware and augers. They are harnessing the power of the dam here. And you can see the dam right down, you see the black water and the water um, going over the dam um, in just beautiful uh, white falls there. And then the large concept um, of the, uh, of the uh, Tiley Pratt structure right behind it. So that group, Centerbrook Manufacturing, actually moves back to the building that was number four, that was Centerbrook Architects. Don't worry, there's not a quiz. Um, but from the 1870s through the uh, 1930s, it's be it becomes the headquarters of the Tiley Pratt Company. And they are specifically making wire goods. Uh, and they have a larger complex. You can see the dam at the right, the, um, the main building to the left with the water wheel, and then the support buildings to the, the left of that. Um, and then we love having photographs of the workers. Now those workers, it was less of a, a complex than the Williams one was. So just a few dozen workers there, all um, local folks, and they're making wire goods spokes for bicycles and later for tires. Um, they are connected with the, um, the Essex company that's on uh, West Avenue and Saybrook Road, where they're also making um, automobiles for a very, very short, short time, the Tiley. Um, and then this becomes an art studio later in the, in the 20th century. Today, is a, it's a private home. Um, that dam uh, exists in remnants now. We'll talk about the flood of 1982 at the very end of this talk. Um, but you can see how there's a portion of the dam still remaining at Tiley Pratt. And then there are um, a fit, there's a couple of fishways and that will help the fish get upstream so um, that they can spawn and grow and then come back down um, stream as well. So there's a way to compromise with all of these dams that stopped the flow of the river over the years. Now we're just starting to put it back into um, more environmental sensitivity. All right, back on with my favorite map. We're going to move from east to west again, and we're going to focus on number three. Um, you may know it as the Brushworks Dam um, or Louie Brush, but this is also the Wright Family Dam. And this was actually started quite early too in 1820. And then by 1825, who's taking over? The Williams family, which is not too far away. Um, they are also turning it into a fulling mill. Now, fulling is a, a a cloth making process in which you take wool that is treated with water and then beat it so that um, it becomes very tough, um, kind of like worsted wool or boiled uh, wool. Um, and that continued for a few years. Again, it's sold and it's turned into a uh, button factory also connected um, with hardware. And then later on by the 1880s, it turns into a new complex and that which you may know as Luby Brush. So from the 1880s through the 1820s, um, it is the Luby and Farg Brush Company. And they are specializing, they are harnessing the power of the Falls River as well. This is one of the few dams that survived 
the uh, flood of 1982, the water just washed right over it. Uh, today, you may know it as Amelie Michelle, right there on the Deep River Road. And so it, there's some other offices and um, some apartments there. Um, but the profile of the building is still the same. It's hard to see from the road. You have to get out into the parking lot and, and walk ar uh, around it. But we have a sample of some of the brushes that they were making there. And they were making all kinds of brushes, things for goblets, for your toilet, for your gun barrels. Um, anything that could be used and made out of um, brush was being sent um, out of the Luby and Farg uh, factory. And they were also one of the first mail order um, companies. So you could purchase anything for your Victorian home with its um, conspicuous consumerism. Um, now, this particular dam also has a fishway in a new, just in between the two falls there, you can see the small um, fishway coming through. So again, you, if you can get, if those fish can get through uh, Falls River Cove, they can get up through Tiley Pratt, now they can get up through the, Luby, the brushworks. Let's go back to number four. That was the original one that we had started with. So we had talked about the grist mill and the sawmill and the Williamses, they had moved their project on from there. But with the good drop in the falls that is here um, right behind Centerbrook Architects at the, um, at the Williams Clark Dam, there is so much more potential from those falls. So we're getting now by the middle of the 19th century, a number of investors, not just family now, this is where we're getting into the industrial revolution. Now you have investors that are not necessarily putting their money into ships. We get the development of banking in this area in the 1950s. They're looking for a better investment and they're doing it in industrial groups. So from the 1850s, 60s, and into the 70s, there are combinations of men, you'll recognize those names, Post, Redfield, Champlin, Hayden. They're all mixing in and they're trying something new. Among them is Samuel Comstock trying to make um, a living out of ivory production. There are a number of I small ivory manufacturings. They have the technology to cut the ivory, but they don't have the supply. That comes a little bit later in the story. But by the 1870s, that Centerbrook Manufacturing Company, which is coming down from the old uh, Tiley Pratt, is establishing itself and then reconsolidating itself into the Connecticut Valley Manufacturing Company. That company continues all the way through to the 1960s on this site. So the image that we have down here at the bottom are the old wooden buildings. The gentleman driving the horse is Alfred Wright. He is the CEO, we would say, of the owner of the company, the owner and the manager. And he and his son, Alf, um, Walter Wright, will be the treasurer. And he's in the, in the other buggy. And they are managing their employees still based on the dam. The sawmill's still going, by the way. So unfortunately, in the 1890s, there is a terrible fire at that site. Um, almost all of the buildings are um, destroyed. And then, of course, wisely, they rebuild in brick. And that is what you recognize today as Centerbrook Architects, the familiar profile and extension. You'll recognize the gray building on the left. And they are making augers and drill bits because we had heard about all of the different kinds of hardware that are being made in small places on these small dams. But it's Connecticut Valley Manufacturing that is truly successful. And in this great image um, at the bottom of the workers themselves, you see Alfred in the center. To his left is his son, Walter. And then maybe to his right, five guys down or so, you'll see a gentleman kneeling. And he's got one of those industrial bits. That's what they're producing. And then at the very back row, they've got a lot the gentleman right in the center with kind of a dark cap. He's got another bit slung over his shoulder. And so these were um, national um, markets that they were sending to. If you were creating, um, if you had your own production facilities, you were buying Centerbrook, uh, excuse me, Connecticut Valley Manufacturing bits. Now they weren't the only ones in this area, but they were very successful and that they are producing well into the 1960s until, until they uh, actually get absorbed and move to New Britain. By 1969, a new group comes in. So you have an abandoned industrial structure. Charles Moore Associates comes from New Haven. It's an architectural firm. And they see the potential in this uh, wonderful location and they begin to restore it and renovate it. And um, by 1981, 
that becomes more Grover and Harper architects, and we know it today as Centerbrook architects. And so they continually uh, restore the structures around them, they expand um, their business. And then also, I wanted to use this image, it's taken from the Falls River, and it shows you how integrated that that building is with the Falls River right in its location. There is an entrance to the old sluiceway just um, in between the brick buildings and the, and the grayish building on the right. Um, and that sluiceway still goes underneath their basement and powers a modern turbine. And that's the turbine that you can see on the right there. About 10% of their power is produced uh, from the water for that turbine. So there's a slow greening of their property and the gentleman at the left there is repairing the sluice gates. So I find it fascinating that this old mill technology is still being used in a very up-to-date way at a cutting edge facility like um, Centerbrook Architects. So let's move to the, let's move west. We're gonna move a little bit farther. So we're at four and now we're going to move to five, which is the bull dam. I wanted to compare our traditional map um, image with a, a period map from the 1850s. And you'll see Main Street is right below the Falls River there. And you can see how the river is pinched in certain places to form those ponds. Those are the dams. Um, if you look at the larger one right in the center, you'll see the um, grist mill at the very end, turning shop. And then at the, if you go down to the other end, you'll see Pettipog Manufacturing Company. But what my great takeaway from this is when you look at Centerbrook, there are so many small shops. So many of them are located on the Falls River on those important roads. And they're all, again, connecting into Center Saybrook or Centerbrook where all of the, the businesses were located. So as we're shifting from the maritime economy of Essex back into Centerbrook where you have the manufacturing, things are going to um, slowly shift again. So right behind um, the bull dam there, that was number five, there is a small drop in the falls and they're creating, um, the Bull family had a dam there from the beginning of the 18th century. Um, by the 1830s, they're really developing into a number of mills. They had a cider mill there, another fulling mill, that's the one for cloth production. And uh, by the 1840s, Samuel Comstock of what was known as West Centerbrook, we would call it today as, as Ivoryton, um, is starting to develop his um, ivory cutting business. And um, he is working with a partner, Mr. Dickinson, and Comstock and Dickinson is trying to make a name for themselves in cutting the ivory. And so there is a, a small dam that they're taking over um, behind the Bull family house, and you can see it right there in the um, background to get the, this is two different perspectives. And what's helpful is to look at that, that dead tree from what it's, it's a wonderful landmark. So you can see it from downstream and then upstream. And then you can recognize um, the bracket shop in the back. It would become the bracket shop under um, Comstock and Cheney. And some really great images, most likely from uh, the 1870s as they're developing, fully developing um, the ivory cutting business that is there. What I find very interesting is this photo features women as well. So they had female industrial workers um, at the uh, bracket shop. And this was at the Bull Dam, which is number five. So let's move completely to the West now and look at number six and eventually number seven. So Samuel Comstock, you're all familiar with that name um, of Comstock Cheney. Um, he he was a mechanical genius. He knew how to cut the ivory. He was not the only ivory cutter in town, but he had a supply problem. And um, he and Dickinson part ways by the 1840s. And Comstock meets with George Cheney. And Cheney had been an, um, an ivory importer for at least 10 years. He solved the supply problem and saw the potential in Comstock. So what they do, develop a new company, Comstock and Cheney, and so by the 1850s then, they are starting, I think it's, 18, excuse me, 1862, they're developing their new company and they're setting it up in West Centerbrook where Comstock is their, um, their native son. So there are dams already on the, uh, in West Centerbrook, but Comstock and Cheney are developing them 
to a great extent. Um, now, talking about ivory is a little bit problematic. Obviously, it comes from elephant tusks, and we have a juxtaposition here of two images as we talk about ivory. They are sourced from interior Africa. Ivory had been used and extracted from Africa and from India um, for years, um, for um, centuries, actually. But as you look at the item, um, the picture to the left, you see a massive tusk being weighed down by four Africans. Now, these American and European companies were um, actually um, working and enslaving the people in Africa to bring these tusks to the coast. And then um, Arab traders would put those Africans into slavery um, themselves. So from the 1860s through the beginning of the 20th century, um, there was an African slave trade that was um, promoting uh, the production of ivory. We cannot look at the story through our eyes of 2021. It is more complicated than that. Um, but by that time, at least a million people were sold into slavery or perished as a result of the, of the ivory trade. So those tusks then are shipped across the Atlantic Ocean and get to um, ivory gin originally by boat and then by train. Um, and then they are prepared here and carefully cut, bleached, matched, um, and used for a variety of ivory products. And that would be the number one marketed item from Comstock Cheney was the veneers and the, uh, of all um, keyboards for pianos. So the gentleman on the right, Mr. Shaler, is proudly um, displaying one of the tusks that was uh, brought to Ivory Tent. And of course, there is Pratt Reed and Deep River too, that is also in the same business. At, at one point, I believe it's 80% it's of the world's ivory production was in these two towns in Ivoryton and Deep River. So the first shop that they're setting up, uh, you'll recognize today as Molar Instruments. This is on our map, it's number six. And this is considered the lower shop where the actual cutting of the ivory was handled. If you're familiar with Ivoryton on Main Street, you know that the Mill Race Preserve is just barely a trickle in a, in a heavily wooded area. Um, but to harness the water power there at at the lower shop, Comstock and Cheney are creating another dam. You can see in the distance, there's the intake, the head race for um, the sluiceway for the water to come through to power the machinery. And then this giant lake was formed as a result to control the power to power the machinery. Um, this is a pretty rare view, I, I believe, um, because it's the, the pond is so almost mirror-like. Uh, and you can see the small uh, structures in the back that are supporting the lower shop. If you've ever taken a tour of the Mill Race Preserve um, with Essex Land Trust, it's very um, illustrating to see how that space was used. And then those triangular structures on the right are the bleaching sheds because the ivory comes in different shades and it was treated in, in a chemical solution. And then through a variety of um, calendar exercises, it's bleached throughout the year. Those are basically um, triangular greenhouses to make sure that the colors match. So the, the dam number five, excuse me, number six, um, you can see it in full, um, full flower, so to speak. Um, the dam would have been right across from the house that Comstock grew up in, which is just past Ivoryton Center, had a, a good uh, drop on it, and that created the large pond um, behind it. You can see the, um, the lower shop in so many of the, uh, the support structures. They were also creating a number of other novelties in addition to the keyboard actions. And when you think about, uh, not the keyboard actions, but the, the keyboards themselves, that ivory was the plastic of its time. And we think about high Victorians, the second half of the 19th century, they are always, there's a, every parlor needs a piano. That was the ultimate in refinement. So that Comstock and Cheney is feeding into this need for consumer goods. And they are ultimately having a fantastic market for their pianos. And then in the front of that are more of the bleaching sheds. If you're interested in seeing a, a bleaching shed, Deep River Historical Society has the last known one on their property, the Stone House. Uh, and a particular favorite uh, photo of mine is on the right-hand side. When we go down West Main Street today, it's all overgrown, but you can see how beautiful the lake is, almost a mirror image of what was then the Swedish church and is now a, um, a private home. But we're not done yet. So we're headed west. Now that long lake, if you were to stand on the dam itself and look west, you can see in the distance the upper shop. 
and that's the ivory the ivory factory that we know today the piano works um, to get your bearings you've got main street on the right i'm looking at the color photograph right now you can see the church in the upper right and then walnut street will continue on the left that pitched um, hill with a few older structures on it at the bottom photo this is very early it's 1870s or so um, and you can see the bit of a lake there forming on the falls river the the profile of what we think of as the upper shop is not recognizable today but this is the core of it this is this is how it started out as the wooden structure this is where they're making the piano actions and so those are the mechanisms inside the piano that are the hammer when you press down on the key to trip to hit the chords themselves um, and that mechanical material is handled here at the at the upper shop and look on the hill you can really see how hilly um, ivory tin is without the vegetation and virtually no structures there are only 10 10 families living in west centerbrook prior to comstock and cheney coming through the last dam is the Clark Dam. It's the, it's the reservoir up even higher on Bushy Hill Road. So to control the, increase the control of the water pressure on Falls River, they create the largest uh, pond itself, and that's up very high. So um, the image at the bottom right is a colorized um, postcard as if you're standing on the shore approximately where Bushy Hill is today. And in the, uh, the distance, you can see the upper shop, the recognizable tower. Now they've got the, the brick factory there. And this was to power the factory itself, but it was also served a few needs in the community. We've got um, the ice cutting uh, long before mechanical refrigeration. You would have an ice box and you'd have to store, you would uh, cut the ice in the winter and then preserve it through the warmer months. Um, so that was a whole business in itself. And we have plenty of images of people ice skating on all of the Comstock uh, Cheney ponds. And this is a great source of recreation, um, Clark's Reservoir. Now the factory dominates the landscape. Remember I said that there were only 10 families living um, in that West Centerbrook area. The factory itself employs more than 500 people at its heyday around 1900. So Comstock and Cheney in their method of um, monitoring and developing their factory village, they're building over a hundred houses for their workers. They're renting units out. There are some purchase choices. There's some renting choices. Um, they build the best school in town, the best grammar school. That's the image at the bottom left there that would have stood right on the um, ivory tin green uh, where the gazebo is. There's all sorts of leisure activities. We think of ivory tin playhouse and the library. The top photo represents the bicycle club. There was a bowling alley in there too. And then of course the famous baseball team. So that the Falls River produces or aids the development of the Comstock Cheney piano factory, but it creates an entire town um, around an entire village around it. So as the fortunes of Comstock Cheney go, and it was the it was the biggest employer in town for years. At one point, it was producing 65% of the town's tax revenue, just the factory um, alone. So the town is so dependent on that. And as the demand for pianos decrease, as we get into the 20th century, when ivory is harder to source, when you have new developments like the phonograph, the record player, eventually um, the radio, there is not that demand for pianos. So the staff gets reduced and gets reduced again. And by 1930s in the Great Depression, it combines with Pratt Reed and it's just a shell of its, its former self. Now there are a number of dependent people in Ivoryton and there are a number of ethnic villages too. They were hiring um, Poles and Italians and um, Swedes. So there are separate neighborhoods. And so you now have these ethnic enclaves all dependent on the factory in, in addition to the traditional local or Yankee workers that were there. And so Ivoryton goes into a, a bit of a decline and by the middle of the 20th century, and then we get to a very dramatic episode on the Falls River. The river giveth and the river taketh away. So in June of 1982, more than 10 inches of rain fell um, in this area in a 24 hour period. Those dams um, that had not necessarily been maintained were weakened. Um, and that first one, I put the map up there again. So number seven, Clark's uh, Reservoir falls at night. And they could, the um, firemen and the, um, the police knew what was going to happen. And so they evacuated everyone. 
Um, we're going to go through quite a few photos now, um, and it's amazing. Keep in your mind the level of destruction. I was not living in this area at this time, but there are so many people that have come forward with personal flood stories. Those are standalone programs in themselves. But like dominoes, as the wall of water, and I've heard a fireman discuss it, that they say it was like a 30-foot wall of water rushing at you, and they're evacuating people left and right out of the path. So as number seven falls and number six and number five, it goes over, it uh, cuts a new channel at Centerbrook Architects at number four, goes over number three. It has absolutely no um, resistance, whatever, and then comes through all the way to number one. Now, Com's, um, Comstock Cheney had become Pratt Reed at that time. They had consolidated. They were barely hanging on. They were making actually, um, there was a sporting goods, um, facility there and they were making golf clubs. There was a number of um, so many feet of wood that was located there. Um, all of that gets carried down into uh, and uh, down the river. People today, today, just a couple of months ago, someone sent me a photo. I found this golf club left over from almost 40 years ago. They are still finding golf clubs in the Falls River as a result of the flood. Um, so when we look at some of these images, you can see the dam break at the top you can see all of the water that's down there at the upper shop surrounding the upper shop. And then this is what's left of the falls uh, of, the, of Clark's uh, reservoir. What was that deep lake where they were um, cutting ice is now just a muddy flat space. And there's the, the water tower in the back. When you look, it was very hard to select um, representative photos, but there's a house on its, on its end. There's a flipped over car in the middle of the um, of the waterway, uh, Falls River. And then, of course, the lumber had to go somewhere. It got stuck on some of the bridges, created um, new waterways. Ivoryton was cut off from most of the other towns for more than a year. They had to go a circuitous route because the roads were blown out. And then here's the back of Centerbrook Architects, where the sluiceway, a new channel was cut for it. That was how intense the water was. So from that time period, they had to rebuild, thanks to the Army Corps of Engineers um, and federal money. Ivoryton and Centerbrook and Essex slowly rebuild after the flood of 1982, but it, it literally becomes a milestone in the people's heads about how we've benefited from the Falls River in the past, and then one night can change everything. So where are, where are we today? So with all of those dams that have, some of them have been rebuilt, not all of them, but we think about the, um, the various ways that we want to embrace the environment in addition to going, um, maintaining the historical integrity of the dams. So at Falls River Cove, there is no longer um, a dam there. So the water goes right over. And we juxtapose that with the new fishway that was installed at Centerbrook Architects in which remember it's 18 feet all the way uh, to the bottom. So the fish can't jump um, there if they're planning on spawning, but through uh, careful channel or chevrons um, that the fish can come up and then they can also come down. So we're finding new ways to make sure that history and the environment are working together because we have this beautiful feature um, that you take for granted sometime in the Falls River um, that is that has sponsored um, and produced and maintained Essex's history in all three of the villages. So I am sure, Allison, I am way beyond my time, but I want to say uh, thank you and if, to learn more. I mean, this is just a brief review of what's possible at um, Falls River in general. So to learn more, our website has so many ways that you can explore and follow the Falls um, program. Well, you have the, the two e-magazines. We have a number of programs coming up. Look at our events. Um, there's so much, so much going on, and I am happy to answer your questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So interesting. I'm going to go to the chat box first. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to either unmute yourself or put them right in the chat box, and I can, I can follow along. Let me just make sure it's everything is set up. All right, I'm going to go in. Oops. I'll unshare if you want. 
Yes, unshare if you if you want. Let's see. Stop sharing. There we go. Um, no questions. I've lulled you all into sleep. I can't believe no one has a question. Oh goodness. Well done. So make sure I'm doing this correctly. I have a quick question. I think I had just started working at the museum when the Fishway at Centerbrook, what, what year was that? The Fishway at Centerbrook Architects? It was it recently, was, right? Kind uh, of. It would have been unveiled in the spring of 2020 because um, as okay. we were planning as Follow the Falls and we had to keep on moving that, but it had been under production for more than a year. Okay, I thought it was quite recent, okay. Let me go to my, um, well, Carol Harper is saying thank you and a terrific presentation. If anyone has any questions, please unmute and ask, feel free or put them right in the chat. Just wanna make sure I'm not missing it here. There, Lo, is it possible to uh, uh, view the, the recording? Um, by uh, by getting onto the website. Yes, this, this recording. Yes, we're going to have it available at both um, the River Museum's um, page and um, and the Essex Historical Society's page mm -hmm. as well. Probably in about. It usually takes us a few days, so not, probably not this week, but by next week. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Like uh, uh, you said, so much that I've got to go. Uh, uh, back again and, and 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 look at it more slowly thank you it was it was okay. tough it's like choosing between your children um yes. how do i tell a, a long story in a very short amount of time and what do i leave out and unfortunately i wish i could add more to but great okay. thank you thank, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, melissa do you know what the depth of the falls river cove used to be before all the sediment got dumped into it I can get back to you on that. I think it would change in various locations. I know that there were, um, this is a terrible way to say this, but there were a number of drownings. Um, so it had to have some considerable depth um, for people that were using it for recreational um, swimming. Um, but off the top of my head, no, I'm happy to um, get your contact information, Bob, from the River Museum, and I can find that answer for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have a question here from Sue Winchell. Is the Iverton Comstock the same family as Comstock in Weathersfield? Same goes for Cheney from Manchester. Okay, but I'll, um, the Comstock one, having worked in Weathersfield, I would safely say no. Um, they, I'm sure they have a common ancestor, but I don't think it's that close. I know that our, com, uh, our Comstocks, um, the Weathersfield ones are developing a lot earlier than Comstock Cheney's are down here. And the difference, oh, this is this is interesting. Coming from the Hartford area, we say Cheney down here. Manchester would say Cheney, I believe. Hmm. Um, so I, I do not know the, the Cheney one, but I know there's a difference. I've been corrected so many times in Essex, it's not Mather, it's Mother. So there are different ways, even in Connecticut, even a 45 minute drive, how things are, are pronounced. Um, I could also look into that for you. I don't think the, the Comstock one is very close though, um, but I could um, look into the one at Manchester. Thank you. That's a tough one. Been lots of thank yous and great jobs, which you'll see later. Any other questions from anyone? No? Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much, Melissa, for rounding out our, our summer speaker series, and I can't think of a better person to do it. And it was very interesting for us, um, particularly for, you know, I have such a focus on the Connecticut River that it's really nice to hear what's, what's going on just a couple of miles down the road. So I really appreciate it and uh, appreciate your support of the museum. And um, I want to thank everyone for joining us and hope to see you soon at the upcoming uh, lecture series in the fall. So take care, everyone. Good night. Good night, Jennifer. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, everybody.